Hello students, welcome to module 4.2.2. Uh, last time we introduced to you the topic of biotechnology. We talked to you about one of the major tools in the toolbox of biotechnologists, uh, namely restriction enzymes. Uh, and today we're going to continue talking about some of the tools in the toolbox of biotechnologists. And the second tool after restriction enzymes we're going to mention uh, is plasmids. Uh, a plasmid is an extra piece of DNA that's found inside bacteria. Uh, you may or may not recall that I previously told you that bacteria typically have a single circular chromosome uh, and all the genes that they need are in this circular chromosome. Um, a plasmid is not in that circular chromosome and therefore by definition uh, a plasmid is not required for a bacterium to live its normal life and fulfill all of its functions. Uh, but the thing about a plasmid is that it has a the ability to be replicated and so when the original uh, the single chromosome inside a bacterium is replicated so is the plasmid. And plasmids are also how bacteria can sometimes pick up extra genes. This is something that eukaryotes just don't really do. Uh, and so a bacterium can actually uh, pick up a gene in the environment by eating parts of a dead bacterium and eating a plasmid and it can be incorporated into the bacterium and then passed on to the progeny of that bacterium. And so uh, I guess I'm saying that plasmids occur naturally in bacteria uh, and the genes are expressed but they really aren't necessary uh, for life. Uh, the reason we bring up plasmids in the context of biotechnology is because they have a definite use here. They're used as what is called a vector. This is a carrier for transferring a gene into a bacterial cell. And once you have that gene in a plasmid in a bacterial cell, well, that, that can serve as a little replicating mechanism. And you can make many hundreds and thousands of copies of a gene that's inside a bacterial plasmid. Uh, so you can turn a bacterium into a little gene factory. Um, and of course, that can be very, very useful. Uh, e. coli, whose uh, E is a, just a an abbreviation, its full name is Escherichia, Escherichia coli, and most, most people have heard about E. coli. Uh, it is the most used bacterial host. We have strains of E. coli that have been growing in test tubes uh, in culture for so long that they can't even live if we put them back into their original home, the gut of a, of a mammal, uh, or a human, of course, is a mammal as well. Uh, so it's really interesting that they have uh, evolved that quickly. Uh, here is an uh, illustration of a bacterial cell, kind of rod-shaped in this case, the bacterial chromosome there, and then the plasmid, which is a, the little extra piece of, of DNA that can be replicated. This is an actual scanning electron micrograph of a plasmid. SEM stands for scanning electron micrograph. So it just looks like a little loop and that's the DNA. Uh, here's a illustration of an experiment that shows the use of plasmids. Um, the first panel here, it shows these little scissors which of course represent restriction enzymes. Unlike scissors, remember that restriction enzymes tend to cut in an offset manner uh, and so they don't cut st straight across but they cut in this offset manner and they leave sticky ends. They show in panel B here that they uh, have sticky ends. Uh, and so everywhere there was a restriction site, that same restriction enzyme would cut. And the, the DNA fragments have sticky ends. And then we use the same restriction enzyme to cut the, the same sequence in plasmid DNA. And this leaves sticky ends. And the thing about the sticky ends from the two uh, restriction enzyme digests is that they are compatible. They're complementary. And so we can just put them together in vitro in a in a test tube in vitro means in glass and so and so we simply put them in there and the result is we get uh, some recombinant plasmids recombinant means we're combining dna from two sources you can see the two colors there um, and we would of course then have to put dna ligase there to make the covalent bonds in the backbone of dna to hold it together but once we did that uh, the 
a host cells uh, could easily be induced to take up the plasmids, and then we have little f factories to make as many of these recombinant uh, genes uh, as we want. So that's the way we use plasmids. Uh, let's look at another tool in the toolbox of biotech biotechnologists. Excuse me. Um, that would be the in, in, in the enzyme uh, reverse transcriptase, which of course uh, allows reverse transcription. Um, now, here's the thing about reverse transcriptase. It, it takes RNA and makes DNA out of it. Restriction enzymes can't cut RNA, so if we have R, a, a sequence of RNA, we cannot use that uh, in DNA experiments. We have to turn it into DNA, and reverse transcriptase allows us to do that. Um, so this is kind of just saying what I just said. Um, of course, this this says what our uh, reverse transcriptase does in nature. Uh, it's an enzyme that catalyzes reverse transcription in retroviruses. And so it uses messenger RNA or mRNA uh, to make uh, DNA. And we, we call the DNA made from messenger RNA with reverse transcriptase, we call it cDNA or complementary DNA. Um, and the, what cDNA can do for us is solve a problem. Um, and this problem is how do we take a gene from a eukaryotic organism like a human and put it into a bacterium? I've just previously described to you how we can use bacterial plasmids as little factories to make uh, many copies uh, of a gene. But the problem is we have to be able, if we want to use it on a human gene, we have to be able to put uh, human DNA into a bacterium. And of course, a bacterium is a prokaryote. And uh, eukaryotic DNA, like humans, has non-coding uh, introns inside it, little segments that don't code, while uh, prokaryotic DNA, like bacterial DNA, doesn't have any. And so if we put in a human gene into a... Uh, bacterial DNA, it won't work uh, because it'll have all these uh, non-coding introns that mess things up. It'll oh, so when it's expressed uh, because uh, bacteria, because they don't have introns, they don't have a mechanism for removing them, and so we have to overcome this problem. And one of the ways we overcome this problem is instead of putting a gene, a eukaryotic gene, into a bacterium. We first will make the gene, uh, I'm sorry, we'll first take a, a mRNA transcript for the gene that we want to make, and so we have it in RNA, and, and remember the RNA has already been processed, so the introns have already been removed from the RNA transcript, and we'll take the RNA transcript and we'll use reverse transcriptase to make CD, uh, cDNA of that uh, gene of interest, and then we can put the cDNA copy of the eukaryotic gene into a prokaryote. Now, if you didn't quite follow that, uh, go through those steps again and understand that what we have to do is take DNA from a eukaryote with introns, and we want to put it into a, a, a bacterium, so we use uh, a form that already has the introns removed. We use the mRNA, then we use reverse transcriptase and put it in. Okay. Um, so this is <laughs> all those words I just said. There it is in one sentence. cDNA is often used to clone eukaryotic genes in prokaryotes. Um, but hopefully you get a little bit better understanding from the explanation I gave. And so there it is again. It allows us to insert intron-free DNA into a host cell which has no introns and no mechanism for splicing out introns, such as bacteria. And here this shows the messenger RNA that we got from a eukaryote. So it has no introns. And so we can use reverse transcriptase to make cDNA. Then we use DNA polymerase to make uh, the single-stranded cDNA to double-stranded DNA that can then be inserted uh, into a... A plasmid in a bacterium. And so pre pretty spiffy stuff, huh? Uh, an additional tool that biotechnologists use is something called PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction. Um, and this is used to make many copies of DNA. Um, so 
it will actually, the PCR amplifies DNA. It will go from one DNA molecule to millions. And so uh, it really is a, an important tool. It was developed by this guy, <laughs> surfer dude there, it looks like. He kind of was a surfer dude, and he was working for a biotech company in California. And he had this idea when he was driving around. It was literally a million-dollar idea because um, he had this problem. He needed more DNA to work with in the lab. He had very small amounts, and he's thinking, well, how can I make more? Well, he's thinking of the process of replication that you know something about. He said, if I could just have replication happen over and over again, I could solve this. And the real breakthrough was when he thought of using a heat tolerant DNA polymerase from a bacterium that lives in hot springs uh, because if we took human DNA I'm sorry if we took a human enzyme and heated it up it would denature but because this organism lives in hot temperatures its DNA didn't denature and so he was able to put that idea together and say ah I can make more so let's look at this idea a little bit more uh, so I already said this, that PCR amplifies uh, DNA, one molecule to, to millions. And it, it starts with some primers, and they're complementary to uh, areas that bracket a gene of interest. So they're on both sides, uh, the primers. And it uses this heat-tolerant TAC polymerase. TAC stands for Thermus aquaticus, which is that hot water bacterium. And so the big thing we get from that is this it's TAC DNA polymerase. I guess I should be more specific here. So you might want to add that on your notes. But DNA polymerase, let's just get an idea of how this process works. Um, so there's a single strand of DNA. I'm sorry, a strand of DNA. It's double-stranded. It shows the two strands as different colors so we can follow it. And here it shows the two different primers that are complementary here. So there's a little sequence here that's uh, complementary to the orange and a little uh, sequence here that's complementary to the yellow. And it shows the arrow shows the direction of uh, uh, replication that's going to occur. And so we put them in, we heat the DNA, and that causes the two strands to unzip, we call it, or to denature. And so double-stranded DNA becomes single-stranded DNA. And then we put in our enzymes, our uh, TAC DNA polymerase, and allows these to uh, lengthen, to replicate. Uh, and of course, we need free nucleotides to do this. So uh, we need periodically to have heat, to have our enzyme, our DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus, and we need free nucleotides. And then that happens uh, we get the lengthening of both the strands. And look, now we have two molecules of DNA. And then we repeat the cycle again. Uh, heat, uh, DNA polymerase, uh, primers, free nucleotides, and then again and again and again. And my explanation wasn't so great, so I would really strongly suggest that you uh, copy and paste this URL into your browser and watch this animation. It's a very well explained animation. And now, at first, when Kerry Mullis first did this, he did it by hand. He heated it up. But now, they have designed these nifty machines called thermocyclers, in which the temperature uh, goes up periodically and it inserts the needed chemicals and just at the right time. So it's really a nifty machine. And so, um, PCR has become very routine and very automated. And so with the, with those are just a few of the tools of biotechnology. There are more tools and techniques, but this isn't a class for majors, and we just want you to kind of get acquainted with them. So with that, we're going to complete this second module.